Okay, the subcommittee will come to order. And uh, let me first apologize to our witnesses. Uh, we just can't control the schedule. Uh, and we were, as you know, number of votes on the floor. Um, I particularly want to apologize to Mr. Wanamaker from the great 4th District of Ohio for having to wait. Never constituents have to wait. That's even more problem. Um, so we'll get uh, organized and started. We'll do our quick opening statements and get right to your testimony. And, and uh, the schedule is now that we're postponed. We may have uh, many members who are unable to be with us today. Hopefully, someone will be able to join us. But we want to thank you all for being here for this uh, for this hearing on such an important topic. Today's hearing of the Regulatory Affairs Subcommittee concerns two issues: how higher prices at the pump are hurting real people in their day-to-day -day lives, and how de a decline in the strength of the dollar, among many other factors, has had a significant role in adding to the price at the pump. In Ohio, the unemployment is, uh, rate is still at 8.4 percent. And the average gas price hit, uh, price hit an all-time high of 416 earlier this month. This has put unbelievable strain on families' budgets and forced painful sacrifices. For the millions of Americans without jobs, rising gas prices has compounded their already tight financial situations. Just this week, in a story in the Chicago uh, Tribune, they reported that higher gas prices have restricted the unemployed from looking for work beyond their immediate communities, which has, of course, limited their options. The trucking industry, which, is ha which we have uh, represented here today, has experienced the full blow of these price spikes. The average national cost of diesel fuel is $3.99 per gallon, and trucking companies are now being forced to implement a surcharge and higher rates to offset their cost increases. And while some industries have been hit harder than others, the effects ripple throughout our economy and are being felt at grocery stores, pharmacies, and in, in every other place that Americans spend their money. We are familiar with some of the factors driving up the price of oil including fear of supply disruptions because of the turmoil in the Middle East and increased demand from developing nations. But one major factor often overlooked is the policy discussions in how the weakening of the dollar has caused the price of oil to rise, and I would argue, frankly, the price of many commodities. Under Chairman Ben Bernanke, the Federal Reserve undertook an aggressive and unprecedented effort known as quantitative easing uh, while keeping interest rates at or below zero. Between December 2008 and March 2009, the Fed purchased $1.7 trillion uh, of Treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. The goal of this first round of, of, of quantitative easing was to reduce unemployment and ensure, quote, price stability, yet the results of QE1 proved lackluster. Nevertheless, the Fed pursued the, the old definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over but expecting different results. Late last year, the Fed began purchasing Treasuries at a rate of about $75 billion a month in a second round of quantitative easing, uh, quantitative easing known in the shorthand as QE2. Now, at the, at the most basic level, quantitative easing is about printing money. And the most basic result is that the value of the dollar falls, commodity prices increase, and American consumers are hit with higher cost of goods and services they purchase. Unsurprisingly, this is, this is precisely what has occurred. The Joint Economic Committee recently released a study that looked at the strength of the dollar since quantitative easing began and found that the 57 cents of the current per gallon price of gasoline, uh, gasoline is directly attributable to the dollar's decline. Today's hearing will attempt to lay bare the consequences of reckless monetary policy and highlight the need for corrective actions to foster a real and sustainable economic recovery. Since November 2008, the value of the dollar has declined by 14 percent and it continues to fall. In fact, by the most widely used index of the dollar's strength, the dollar is now at its weakest point on record. And while we may grant that what the Federal Reserve Vice Chairman Donald Cohn noted earlier last year, that the central bank is in uncharted waters, Experience with financial disruptions of the breadth, persistence, and consequences of, of the past several years, there is no denying that the Fed knew full well that such an undertaking in the realm of monetary policy could have a weakening, weakening effect on the dollar, which would mean an increase in the price of commodities bought and sold internationally. Ironically, Chairman Bernanke testified a couple months ago before the Senate Banking Committee that he knew that rising gas prices could negatively affect American consumers and hinder an economic recovery. He stated, quote, sustained rises in the prices of oil or other commodities would represent a threat both to economic growth and to overall price stability, close quote. It is the intent of this hearing to broaden the discussion about the causes and effects of higher gas prices so as to fully understand actions the Federal Government can and should take to aid distressed American consumers and American small business owners. With that, I yield to the Ranking Member for uh, an opening statement. Members recognized. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. 
And uh, when you and I talked, we were both sharing our concerns about the high price of gasoline that is really quite devastating to families in our respective districts. So I, I think that uh, this hearing will help draw much-needed attention to the plight of American businesses and families as they struggle to deal with the effects of high oil prices. And this hearing brings to us witnesses who are esteemed, and uh, their presence here is uh, quite appreciated. Thank you. Congress cannot continue to allow American consumers to bear the brunt of our energy policies which grant oil companies massive tax deductions in exchange for the privilege of reaping an unimaginable profit from extraction from the earth. Despite the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, oil companies are charging record high gasoline prices, and they have continued to make the highest profits of any industry in the world. Low-income families across this country, including in my own district in Ohio, are especially harmed by high gas prices because they have a crippling effect on the price of food. While well, gas prices have recently come down a little, they are still, little, they're still too high for many Ohioans and Americans who have seen their income stagnate and decline. And I am very concerned that the burden gas prices place on American families and businesses could threaten any economic recovery. With gas prices sky high, this hearing can play an important role in helping us understand the cause of oil price uh, volatility. As uh, my a friend, Mr. Jordan, knows uh, we share a, uh, to put it mildly, antipathy towards the Fed. Uh, and at the same time, I'm, I'm concerned that on, on, this, uh, on this particular case uh, that we may uh, risk missing the forest for the trees, because uh, in, in my research I, I'm still trying to determine what kind of control the Fed has uh, in, terms, in terms of key drivers of high oil prices. Now, the oil prices have soared recently in part because of the rising demand in developing countries such as Brazil, China, and India. <clears throat> While consumption of oil in the U.S. may be slowing, global demand is at record levels, causing prices to soar. War, unrest in the Middle East, uh, countries where they are the oil producing uh, countries, has also driven up prices. Uh, the Fed doesn't have any control over these price determinative factors and it doesn't oversee the derivative market for oil that has really had a lot to do with fueling gas price uh, spikes. Uh, we know the Commodity Futures Trading Commission does have something to do with it. And what has been happening is that speculators have been betting on the future price of oil, and they have contributed to the, to the increase, sharp increases in oil prices. And, and what they are doing is they are encouraging oil producers to hoard their commodity in the hopes they will be able to sell it later at a higher future price. So it is speculation in the, in, in, at the commodity futures, um, in, in the oil commodities that I think is, is something that is very important to focus on. The F full committee uh, released a report on Monday finding that excessive speculation could be inflating gas prices by as much as 30 percent. So, I mean, do the math. You know, we are paying Four, over $4 uh, in some regions. Uh, th that is what the price has been. Yesterday, the CFTC charged five oil speculators with manipulating the price of crude oil in 2008 and making a $50 million profit from the scheme. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like unanimous consent to enter into the record a New York Times and CNNMoney.com article reporting on the, um, C on the Commodity Futures Trading uh, Commission enforcement actions. Oh, yeah, without, without objection. And, and stopping, thank you, Mr. Chairman, stopping the manipulation of the market uh, for the energy on which we are painfully dependent will have a significant impact on lowering gas prices. We have to ensure that the Commodity Futures Trading Commission has the resources and authority to implement the Dodd Frank reforms passed last year to curb rampant oil speculation. And most fundamentally, volatility in oil and gas prices will continue to threaten American prosperity until we change our nation's energy policy. We have to free ourselves from oil dependence, which has enriched oil companies and left Americans struggling to pay for gas to go to work. It has also uh, left us uh, with an environment that has uh, been spoiled. The path to a sustainable energy future demands that we focus on energy efficient technologies and renewable energy resources for our energy supply. 
I want to thank the Chairman and thank the witnesses. I look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Thank, thank the Ranking Member. Um, again, let me welcome our witnesses and apologize with, with the change in schedule. Just, we're going to have a lot of members who aren't going to be unable to be here who would otherwise have been here at the 1 o'clock uh, hour. Um, we have Mr. Vincent Reinhardt, formerly the Director of the Division of Monetary Affairs at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. He is currently a resident scholar with the American Enterprise Institute. We have with us Dr. Murphy. Dr. Robert Murphy is he's an economist with the Institute for Energy Research. Dr. Dean Baker is the co-director uh, of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Mr. Greg Wanamaker is president of Wanamaker Total Logistics. And Ms. Karen Kerrigan is president and CEO of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. It's the practice of this committee to swear witnesses in. So if you just stand and raise your right hand. And then just answer in the affirmative. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If you do, so say, I, I do. All right. Thank you. Let the record show everyone answered in the affirmative. And we will go right down the list, starting with Mr. Reinhardt from AEI. Uh, thank you, Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Kucinich, for the opportunity to discuss monetary policy and the price of oil. I believe that this is an appropriate use of the subcommittee's time as both the net rise and the volatility of oil prices over the past nine months are partly a predictable byproduct of the Fed's expansion of its balance sheet in its policy known as quantitative easing. QE was essentially designed to give a nudge to risk taking. Fed officials announced they would purchase rich, riskless Treasury securities on the hope that investors would reinvest the proceeds in riskier assets such as corporate equities and bonds. But not all the effects of QE has played out in financial markets. Since the Fed firmly signaled in, in August its intent to launch the latest round of QE, oil prices have risen from $76 a barrel to around $100 per barrel. Why does the Fed matter for oil prices? Uh, the producers of oil, as well as other commodities, typically sell their output in a worldwide market priced in U.S. dollars. Thus, they care about the current and expected future purchasing power of the dollar and how that will translate into goods and services back home. But QE has been associated with higher inflation and dollar depreciation which combines to erode the purchasing power of the foreign producers of commodities. Thus, some of the rise in the nominal price of oil has been to catch up with that erosion. More important in shaping near-term oil price dynamics has been, to the, been the nudge to investors from QE to move from safe to riskier investments. The commodity market has been one outlet for that reinvigorated search for yield. This has been reinforced by the Fed's policy of keeping short-term nominal interest rates near zero, which keeps it cheap to trade on borrowed funds. Such speculation can fuel spasms of enthusiasm or angst that trigger wide swings in prices, although on net and over the longer term, speculators neither consume nor produce oil. This increase is in the price of oil and its heightened volatility poses three distinct problems for the Fed and for the macroeconomy. First, a rise in energy cost of one-third takes a distinct bite out of Americans' budgets, working to restrain spending in an economy already burdened by lingering balance sheet problems from the financial crisis. As of yet, the oil price shock is not as large as those associated with severe macroeconomic dislocations of the past half century, though. Second, increases in the price of oil, as well as those of other commodities, have fueled an upsurge in inflation and a depreciation of the dollar on foreign exchange markets. Fed officials continue to believe that people are not likely to, to expect the prices of other goods and services to rise commensurately. If so, and if commodity prices do not continue to rise, then the level upshift in oil prices will ultimately pass out of inflation calculations. Third, in recent months, the world seems to be a much less safe place. This makes the near-term balance between oil and demand and supply volatile. This could, to the Fed's regret, also make global investors more skittish and undercut some of the benefits in financial markets attributable to QE. On net, it is likely that the economy-wide effects of the energy shock are 
unpleasant, but not derailing to economic expansion. But this is a gamble, and one that Fed officials must apparently have accepted when they decided to launch QE. We will live with the consequences of that judgment in coming quarters. Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. Uh, Dr. Murphy. Well, thank you uh, for having me and thank you for having this uh, hearing. I think it is very important that the, the public realizes the possible role the Federal Reserve has been playing in high oil prices. Unfortunately, a lot of my prepared remarks are going to overlap with what Mr. Reinhardt said, so I, I wish I had gone first and then he would be copying me. Um, but I will go ahead and, and maybe I will say uh, the same points in somewhat different language. The, so, so, of course, what everyone knows is that the Federal Reserve has expanded its balance sheet since the crisis set in by about $1.6 trillion in terms of what is called the monetary base. So that is how much physical currency is in circulation plus banks checking account uh, deposits with the Fed, as it were. So to, to put that number in perspective, from the time the Fed was founded in late 1913 up until the fall of 2008, they hadn't put that much in. So the Fed has added more in the last two and a half years than the entire history of the Fed up until that point. And that number is, was $1.6 trillion, you said? Right, about okay. $1.6 trillion and, yeah, has, how much they have added since September of 2008 to the monetary base. And the, up until that point was $932 billion right. from 1913 to then. So, so when we say that there's unprecedented interventions, I mean, that is not hyperbole. It really is. And, of course, we know same time period, the price of oil has, depending on when you start and, and stop it, has almost tripled. So the question is, do the two have anything to do with each other is, is the coincidence. So in my written testimony, I gave the two main mechanisms by which Fed policy could be driving the increase in oil prices. So the first one is what the Joint Economic Committee focused on in their recent report. And what they looked at was just the fall in the dollar against other currencies, because as Mr. Reinhardt said, oil is an international fungible commodity, so oil prices basically have to be the same for everybody once you adjust for currency uh, exchange rates. And so if the dollar is falling against other currencies, that means the oil price quoted in U.S. dollars is going to go up, everything else equal. So in other words, Americans have seen oil prices go up more than the Japanese, for example. Right. All right, so that was. So if you look, at, they looked at, uh, the JEC report looked at from, I guess, when QE1 was announced in November of 2008 up until whenever this report came out, and they said the dollar fell about 14 percent, looking at the index they used. And so on those calculations, that is how they are coming up with the figure that if the dollar had stayed as strong as it was when QE1 was announced up until today, then right now gas prices at the pump would be about 57 cents lower. Okay, so that is the logic they are using to come up with that estimate is they are saying the dollar has fallen since the announcement of QE1 and then QE2, and hence if, if the dollar stayed the same, then gas would be 57 cents cheaper at the pump right now. That is what their argument is. Uh, there's a, but there is a whole other possible mechanism that they didn't address, and that is, is it possible that the, the broad rise in commodities in general, regardless of the currency that you are using, could that also be right. influenced by Fed policy? And I would argue that it is, but it is hard to come up with with a quantitative amount. Um, just for, for qualitative uh, arguments, commodities in general have gone up. So it is not just that oil went up. It is commodities across the board. And even, like for example, gold and silver, since the crisis in the fall of 2008 till now, gold has gone up about 80 percent and silver something like 210 percent. Right? So I don't think that I think it is very plausible to say at least some of that is due to people are afraid of the dollar being debased, and so they are rushing into the precious metals you know, as, as an inflation hedge. It is not just that people in China are given more jewelry as presents, and that is why gold and silver are up so much. Right? So if you, if you buy the logic there when it comes to gold and silver, it is not a stretch to say, well, maybe some investors, you know, there is lots of liquidity floating around. What are they going to do with their money? They are not going to put it in real estate, obviously. Maybe they don't want to put it in the stock market because the economy is bad. Maybe they're going to go into commodities, thinking, you know, this is surely wheat and oil are always going to have, you know, a demand, and so I'm going to. That's a way to protect my wealth in case there's future inflation. So that's the other possible mechanism by which Fed policy could be worked. So, you know, given whatever the world price of oil is, that the dollar falls, that's one thing. But the other mechanism is maybe commodities. Part of that huge upswing is people are trying to hedge themselves uh, against inflation. So those, so those would be the two. Uh, and if I can inter interrupt, just for a second, and would you say so? That's not that just maybe just 
good, smart, practical investing versus any type of speculator driving the price up? Well, yeah. I mean, I, it depends what your perspective is. To me, that's like saying, you know, is it it's cold out because the thermometer is, is showing a low reading. I mean, mm -hmm. if if people think that something bad is going to happen, then they react, and that's that's the whole point of or one of the points of having futures markets in the first place right. is okay. to anticipate future movements. We'll give you a few thirty more seconds if you want, since I took some of your time. Uh, that that's fine. Okay. I'll Thanks, stop. Doctor. Dr. Baker. Thank you, uh, Chairman Jordan and uh, Ranking Member. Member Kucinich, I appreciate the chance to talk on this set of issues. I want to make three main points. First, what I'm going to say is that the Fed's policies at most contribute a very small amount to the increase in price of gas. Um, secondly, I'm going to say that a decline in the dollar is both uh, desirable and necessary. And then very briefly, I'll just say that most of the rise in the price of oil has been attributed, attributable to other factors, and the three obvious ones I think they have all been mentioned here, one, the growth in the developing world, two, the instability in the Middle East, and the third, that there is certainly speculation in the oil market, which I would argue has had some effect on prices. Okay, the first point, the, the quantitative easing policy, I, I find it hard to quarrel. I have been a critic of the Fed quite often and, and often quite harsh, but I find it hard to quarrel with their policy here. We have had the worst downturn the country has seen since the Great Depression. It was a, a, a situation that called for a very aggressive response, and the Fed gave, to my mind, a relatively timid one with its policy of quantitative easing given the current circumstances. So the intention, of course, was by buying large amounts of, of mortgage-backed securities, and government bonds that they would not just lower the short-term rate, which had already pushed down to zero, but lower the long-term rate, and this would have three beneficial effects. On the one hand, it would give some boost to investment. Secondly, it would make it easier for people to refinance mortgages. We have 30-year mortgages at the lowest rate they had been in more than half a century. And third, that it would actually lower the value of the dollar. That was quite deliberately one of the intentions, the idea being that that would encourage net exports. Um, it did, I would say, have somewhat of that effect, but I think the impact has actually been very limited. I think there is a real distortion in this discussion in the sense that there was a big run-up in the dollar in the fall of 2008. So if you go back and look at the history, the dollar rose by around 14 percent between the, the summer of 2008 and the fall, which was a direct response to the financial crisis. People, there is a flight to safety. People have always gone to the dollar when there has been a flight to safety. That has led to a large increase in the value of the dollar. You could perhaps blame QE1, QE2 for helping to stabilize world financial markets and that way getting over that fear, but we should have expected that that run up in the dollar would be reversed once we saw the economy stabilized to some extent. As it stands now, the dollar is just a little bit below where it was, I think about two percentage points below where it was before the run up. And I should point out, I can come back to this, I think there is a misunderstanding about the broad indexes, which is what I assume you referenced in saying it was at the lowest level ever. I think that when you look at a measurement issue in there, it is really not. I can come back to that. But the other point I want to make in that respect is that the dollar had been falling. This is not something that just happened. So the dollar had been falling from 2002 until the financial crisis in 2008. And if we just envision we had continued on that downward trend, the current value of the dollar is still about 16 percent higher than what it would have been on that trend. So there is nothing new in this story. Second point, uh, we need a lower value dollar. The dollar, in a system of floating exchange rates, the dollar fluctuates to equilibrate trade. We have a very large trade deficit, currently about $600 billion. The only mechanism I could think of to get that down is a lower value dollar. As I said before, I take that that was one of the main motivations of the quantitative easing policy because that is how you boost our net exports. You make our exports cheaper for people living in other countries. You make imports more expensive for people living in the United States. That is unpleasant, but there is no way around it. In the context of the price of oil, the way I would see it is that if we deliberately try to have an artificially high dollar, we run a high dollar policy even though it is leading to very large trade deficits, in effect what that means is we are borrowing money from foreigners to subsidize our consumption of imports. In this case, we are talking about the price of oil. We would all like cheaper gasoline. I would like to pay less at the pump, too, but I am not really sure it is a good policy to tell our kids that we are going to be borrowing huge amounts of money from abroad so that we could have cheaper gas today. That is what a high dollar policy means. The last point I was going to say is that you know, it is easy to find the culprits, if we want to call them that, in terms of what is pushing up the price of oil. We have countries like China, which is now the second largest consumer of oil, growing 10 percent a year. 
India coming up fast as well, also growing 10 percent a year. That is leading to rapid increases in the demand for oil. There is no corresponding increase in the supply. Um, uncertainty, we all know about the situation in the Middle East, and we could certainly fairly easily tie the most recent run-up in the price of oil. It went from roughly 80 a barrel to over 100 a barrel when the civil war in, India, in, in Libya broke out in earnest. The last point is speculation. We know there is speculation in the market. Uh, uh, Ranking Member Kucinich referred to the article in the New York Times today about uh, SEC action against speculators that pushed the price of oil to 150 a barrel before the downturn. Clearly, there is some speculation again today. So just to conclude, I would say that, you know, if we take a look at the Fed's actions, I would say for the most part they have been, you know, largely on the right track, and insofar as they contribute to the higher price of oil, I really don't think there is anything we could, can or should think to do about that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baker. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Baker. Um, Mr. Wanamaker. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich. I really appreciate this opportunity to testify today regarding the impact of higher oil prices on the trucking industry. Oil prices have a dramatic effect on our business. Part of our business is a trucking operation. We operate 38 trucks. 33 trucks operate in the mid-Atlantic and Midwestern states, and five other trucks operate locally, shuttling loads to our various distribution centers and to our customers' plants, picking up customers' loads and making local pickups and delivery. The cost of fuel has risen to be our single largest expense item. When I took over our company in 1991, fuel expenses were only 6 to 7 percent of revenue. During the last four years, our fuel expenses were the following as a percent of revenue, 32 percent in 2007, 41 in 2008, 29 in 2009, 31 in 2010. Now in the first quarter of 2011, that expense was 36 percent of revenue. Over the years, we have tried various techniques to better control our, our exposure to the fluctuation in fuel costs. We have had our own fuel tanks until the EPA regulations made it uneconomical for a fleet our size. We tried hedging a portion of our anticipated purchases to lock in the pricing. We contract with fuel service providers to buy at a fixed rate over their cost or off the, off the listed pump price. We have set our truck's top speed at 65 miles per hour installed onboard auxiliary power units to eliminate idling, gone to wide base tires with a system to keep pro tires properly inflated at all times. And, of course, we have contracts with our customers that include fuel surcharges to help offset the fluctuation of fuel costs. For a fleet our size, hedging and contract fuel purchases are extremely challenging and very time consuming. Small operations find themselves at a disadvantage trying to find the time necessary to stay informed and educated on the constantly changing pricing structures and formulas the vendors try to institute. Fuel surcharges are the least cumbersome for us to manage. The biggest challenge with this is that customers want you to lock your rates in for a minimum of one year. Depending on how their business is doing and whether they will take the time to renegotiate annually can also be an impediment. Because of our small size, in some instances, we do not provide enough impact on their capacity to get their attention. The fuel prices we are encountering today are having a huge impact. The best way to explain this is to illustrate how much profit we lose with fuel prices at the current levels. Let me explain how fuel surcharges are implemented. Fuel surcharges only apply to loaded miles. Our fleets run about 15 percent empty miles. Our average truck runs 2,700 miles per week. The fleet average is 6.6 .6 miles per gallon. 15 percent of the miles are equal to 405 miles per truck per week, which we see no reimbursement from the increased cost of fuel. The impact from the average cost at 250 per gallon for fuel last seen in the fall of 2009 to the recent average of $4 per gallon is $1.50 per gallon on the 62 gallons it takes to run the 405 miles. Roughly speaking, that is $92 in lost money per truck per week. Remember, I told you we run 38 trucks, so therefore that is almost $3,500 per week. At the current rate, it will be a loss of $180,000 for the year for our fleet. Now, if it weren't for the higher fuel prices, we have recognized four potential areas for those extra funds. First, we could invest in more trucks. Secondly, we would look to increase technology. Third, to increase our driver's pay. And finally, to reduce the debt on our equipment. Since 2008, 
Many fleets have reduced the size of their operations, and significant amounts of others have simply gone out of business. Now we are starting to see a shortage of trucks. With the capacity shortage, we would utilize the extra money to increase the size of our truck fleet. This would create more jobs at our company. We could immediately grow our fleet 10 percent if the fuel prices were back down to $250 a gallon. A primary objective of our company is to look at and invest in new technologies and innovations that can help improve our fuel mileage. We do a cost-benefit analysis on any proposed improvements to justify any expenditure. It is imperative that the payback period is shorter than the useful life of the equipment and will not hinder the resale value at trade-in time. During the downturn in the economy, most trucks, including ourselves, found it necessary to reduce drivers' wages to remain competitive. If fuel costs could get back in line, I believe you would see an increase in drivers' wages across the board. Our final option would be to reduce the amount of debt we still have on our equipment. Solidifying the net worth of our company will enable us to secure better financing terms in the future, and it is certainly no secret that bankers today are taking a closer look at companies' debt to net worth ratio. During the fuel spikes in 2008, we elected to gradually reduce our fleet down from 64 trucks to the current level of 38 trucks. If pricing continues to vacillate, we will definitely reduce more to prevent losses. We certainly don't like to be put in this position, but we can't continue to put the remainder of our company at risk. Since it is our largest expense item, stabilization in the cost of fuel is extremely necessary and vitally important to provide the ability for trucking operations like ourselves across the country to remain in business. We have absorbed the cost increases due to regulations of EPA on our truck engines and fuel storage facilities, as well as the escalation of other government regulations and enlarged payroll taxes caused by high unemployment in all sectors of the workforce. We cannot continue on this wild ride created by speculators and some in our government holding back on drilling opportunities that would reduce our dependency on foreign oil. Not just trucking companies, but the American people need stabilization in fuel prices. Thank you for this opportunity to testify, Mr. Chairman Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Wanamaker. We appreciate giving the small business owner's perspective. Ms. Kerrigan. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Kucinich. Thank you for hosting today's hearing and uh, for inviting the views of, uh, and concerns of small business owners uh, to be considered on this important issue. Um, I have been asked to provide a, a general snapshot, if you will, regarding the impact of high gas prices on small business owners and entrepreneurs. Uh, needless to say, the high costs are making it very difficult for small businesses to compete, uh, to grow, and, and even survive uh, in what remains a very, very difficult economic environment. For many small business owners, sales and revenues remain weak, while business costs continue to move higher. Business owners, for example, are very, very concerned and, and continue to stay burdened with um, high health insurance costs, with employee benefit costs. At the same time, raw material costs continue to go higher, uh, supplies, uh, shipping, et cetera. All these costs continue to go higher, uh, and with uh, weak revenues, this is squeezing small business owners. So obviously costs uh, are a major issue for small business owners, how to control them, how to contain them, uh, how to deal with them and remain competitive in a very, um, very competitive global uh, economy. Tight cash flows combined with slim profit margins limit the flexibility that uh, many small business owners have in responding to higher costs, um, uh, particularly unexpected ones. So unquestionably, small business owners are feeling the pinch of higher gas prices. Uh, the regular feedback that we receive from our members as well as uh, small business owners across the country point to significant effects that we believe are undermining the economic recovery. This feedback has been backed up by um, our latest Entrepreneurs in the Economy survey that we released this week, which finds that the specific ways that business owners are dealing with higher uh, gas prices could have profound uh, consequences for our economy, and particularly uh, if, the, if prices remain high. Uh, Seventy-four percent of business owners, uh, according uh, to that survey, report that higher gas prices are having an impact on their business. 
47 percent report that higher gas prices are affecting their plans to hire new employees. 41 percent have raised prices due to higher gas prices. 26 percent have had to cut employees or their hours worked. And staggeringly, 38 percent believe if gas prices remain high or increase further, their business will not survive. Obviously, how business owners respond to higher gas prices not only impacts their own competitiveness and capacity to grow, but also impacts uh, the overall health of the United States economy. If small business owners are not hiring, if they are cutting hours, if they are cutting jobs, our entire economy suffers. Likewise, if small business owners are putting fewer resources into investments and innovative projects, the vibrancy of the economy suffers along with the overall national competitiveness. So high gas prices um, are hitting uh, the two uh, major pain points of small business owners. Um, obviously, um, uh, higher gas prices are raising business costs, which is forcing many business owners to do things like raising prices that put them at a competitive disadvantage. Um, secondly, uh, high gas prices are hurting sales as customers have fewer disposable dollars to purchase the goods and services provided by small business owners. And as I noted uh, in my uh, written testimony, a, um, uh, a survey, um, a dollardays.com survey, found that 64 percent of business owners report lower sales uh, due to higher gas prices. Uh, especially as our nation uh, is working to emerge from the recession, it is more important than ever that small businesses operate in a more predictable environment. I think they continue, they, they continue to tell us that uncertainty pretty much rules their, their everyday operations. Uh, without certainty, without predictability, small business growth will be studied, and these firms simply will not be able to create the large-scale number of jobs that are, that are desperately needed by our economy. Thank you again for hosting these hearings, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Kerrigan, and, and all our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Wanamaker, you, you mentioned you, your fuel costs have went from 6 percent, I think you said, 6 or 7 percent, to now somewhere in the last three years a range of 30 to 40 percent. Um, is that accurate? Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, it, it just, it's huge. And obviously, it's had an impact on your industry and I assume every other trucking industry out there. But um, do, do you, have you noticed your customers um, that it is impacting them. It, it, if we look, listen to Ms. Kerrigan's testimony, obviously it is, but have you seen that in a firsthand way with your, with your customers and, uh, that you deal with? Yes. The, the biggest impact is you, you get the, the small uh, companies that aren't, you know, the larger companies are familiar with fuel surcharges and are willing to absorb that. But it is the smaller companies that don't ship as many truckloads in a week that it really is alarming to them and they try to absorb those things rather than try to pass them right. on to their customers. Right, right. And you have seen that as well, Ms. Kerrigan, uh, relative to the surcharge issue. Have you had any specific issue, uh, 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 examples with, with uh, your folks on the surcharge issue? On being impacted by yeah. surcharges? Well, I think uh, um, shipping, I think, is a huge one, you know, where, you know, if um, uh, anything that they are uh, re receiving, uh, florists, I think the florist industry in particular, Mm -hmm. um, are receiving, uh, you know, a fair, fair amount of surcharges on shipping. Yeah. Um, the other thing you mentioned uh, in, in your testimony, Ms. Kerrigan, was um, the other regulatory concerns that, that are uh, other regulations that are concerned to business owners. <coughs> one, one of the focuses of this subcommittee is, is, you know, regulation and how that impacts business. Um, talk to me about some of the things. In addition to the gas price issue, we got other things that government is doing. Talk to me about some of the specific things that, that you think are, are negatively hurting uh, job growth and economic growth right now. Well, gosh, where do you start? Right? We could, well, you were a minister. Well, I think, well one. one big one, um, I think, is the health care issue and, um, you know, the concerns about what the health care uh, reform bill, as it gets implemented, what it means for, the, for their health insurance costs, sure. because they don't see them going down. They can continue to see them going up you know, what the employer mandate is going to mean, you know, for their business, what the fines are going right. to mean. Um, I and and, and it is this cumulative effect that, that I, concerns me, I think concerns many members of Congress and obviously concerns. So it is not just well, you can point to one, but it is it's one on top of the other. Now you throw in the gas price it's issue. It is one on top of the other. I mean, there is a tax issue and uncertainty right. what their taxes are going to be. 
I mean, there is the implementation of Dodd-Frank. What is going to be in yeah. terms of their cost and act availability of capital uh, and loans? It is all that. It is very difficult to get traction. And right. a business owner needs momentum. They need traction in order to grow and have the confidence right. um, to do the things that they need to, in order to invest and to create jobs. Mr. Wanamaker, can you comment on this cumulative effect that, that concerns so many of us? You know, it is. It is just a compounding of when you have the EPA issues. For example, the, the, when the uh, EPA changed the regulation on the truck engines, we ended up paying about, for the first round, it was about uh, $6,500 for just the EPA regulations. The second round was an, an additional uh, $8,000. And so it is just a compounding thing of those type of things. When we went, went to low sulfur fuel, which gave us lower fuel mileage, mm -hmm. higher cost trucks, lower, lower fuel mileage, and you know, we can only pass on the fuel surcharge based on the price of fuel. So that was also a loss. And then what Ms. Kerrigan said also about uh, the health care, I mean, that just creates such an instability in your mindset as far as going forward, those added on costs of government regulations that really have no really don't belong there in a lot of instances. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, let, me, let me turn to our other guys, and we will we'll do a second round here. Um, I am just curious, and let me start with maybe Mr. Reinhardt. In the last couple of years, is, and I, I genuinely don't know the answer to this one, has the Fed been the largest purchaser of Treasuries? Are they the single largest purchaser and or holder? Of, of, of Treasuries in the last, say, two years? Uh, no, actually. Uh, here, here's a good comparison. That surprised me, because I think it's like $75 billion in certain months. Been... So when the Fed so who's, put, who's put, the largest holders? It's... put quantitative easing on QE2 on the table in August, since then it has expanded its balance sheet by $500 billion of extra Treasury securities. Okay. Over that same period, Foreign official entities have increased their holdings of government securities held in custody at the New York Fed by $1 trillion. Okay. So in some sense, as Dr. Baker noted, the net chain depreciation of the dollar has been pretty modest. So you can't say it contributes a lot to the rise in oil prices. But that actually masks two effects. The Fed has been buying Treasury securities with $500 billion of extra dollars. But it, which would tend to move the dollar lower. Sure. But at the same time, foreign official entities have been buying a trillion dollars of Treasury securities with their own currencies, tending to offset what the Fed is doing. Okay. But uh, you said foreign. So total fo foreign holdings of Treasuries is bigger than the Fed. Is, oh, but is the Fed certainly. the single biggest holder? Are they bigger yes. than so the, the single biggest entity holding Treasuries today in Our the last two years would be, would be the Fed? The, the single biggest entity in terms of the stock holdings of tra government securities right now would be foreign official entities. Oh, come more on. than the Fed, yes. That is the reserve managers, okay. China, India, Russia, Brazil, yeah. and, and the like. And then would the Fed be second? The Fed would be second. Ahead of other funds and individuals, and et cetera? Yes. Okay. Okay. I will get back to our other stuff. I want to get to our ranking member, and then we will do another round. Uh, let me ask Mr. Reinhardt just a quick follow up. Uh, I, I was distracted for a second. I want to make sure I got your answer. Uh, of the trillion dollars that's being purchased, did, did you say who's buying those from abroad? China, you said. And so, so all we know is that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York holds Treasuries, government securities in custody for foreign official right. accounts. Okay, but if you, that went up a trillion dollars. Okay, got we it. don't know the composition of that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Baker, in March uh, 2, 2011, Congressional Research Service a report entitled uh, U.S. Trade Deficit, the Dollar, and the Price of Oil, uh, which I am uh, going to ask unanimous consent be entered into record. No objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in this, CRS agrees with your assessment that the Fed's monetary policy actions have not been the main driver of uh, higher oil and gas prices. Now, um, Can a case, however, be made here that there is a tangential effect that the Fed has uh, on these prices? I mean, and some of our witnesses uh, have made that. Would you comment on, on their uh, analysis? Well, again, I would say, and the CRS report, of course, agrees that there was some impact in lowering the dollar. But again, I think that was relatively modest. Um, you know, and I, I think most evidence suggests that. The the other issue is. Uh, I had said, and the other witnesses I think suggest, is 
may be put in a different way, but that the low interest rate environment does create a situation which you are likely to see some speculative run up in, in the price of oil and other commodities. And I, I think that has certainly been true. That was certainly true in the period in, in 07, 08 when oil hit $150 a barrel. And it would be surprising to me that there is not some speculation there today. It just stands to reason that when there are sharp movements, almost invariably, at least some of that is driven by speculation. Does, uh, does speculation driven by being able to trade with borrowed money? Of course. Uh, you know, speculators tend, the way you make money as a speculator is you become heavily leveraged, and if you could do so cheaply, then it makes it easier to speculate. Let, let me ask you, um, well, first of all, just a preface. Uh, we can debate the causes of high oil and gas prices, but I, I think that you know, just in my own opinion, we have to keep in mind that the U.S. ranks second in the world in fossil fuel consumption, and energy producing companies have used our dependence on oil to enrich themselves and, uh, and pollute the air and the land. It is clear to me that what we are seeing is the result of a monopoly, and by that I mean when it comes to individual transportation, there is only one source, major source of fuel, and that is oil. And Americans depend on it every day to get to work, get their kids to school get groceries, conduct their daily lives, uh, businesses are dependent on it, as has been pointed out. So the demand for oil is fairly inelastic. When demand is inelastic, there is a monopoly in supply, conditions are ripe for the kind of price manipulation that was documented uh, in, in the minority report issued on Monday, and that led the Commodity Futures Trading Commission to charge five oil speculators with illegal price manipulation uh, yesterday. Dr. Baker. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the effects of monopoly uh, uh, of oil on our economy and about the possibility that breaking that monopoly with alternative energy sources, what that would mean for our economy? Sure. I, I just realized earlier I had made a reference to the Securities and Exchange Commission. You are correct. It was the Commodities Future Trading Commission that brought those charges. So just to correct my earlier statement. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I see it as a situation as, in effect, we, we were subsidizing oil consumption, um, part of that story being an overvalued dollar. So in a situation where we are running a very large trade deficit, in effect what we are doing is borrowing money to get oil and other imports cheaper than would otherwise be the case if we had a dollar that was consistent with more balanced trade. And obviously when you have a situation where there is a relatively small number of oil companies that are in a position to take advantage of shortages, temporary shortages, it makes it a more volatile environment because, as you say quite correctly, at least in the short term, demand is very inelastic. When you have a relatively small number of suppliers, but, supply can be very inelastic. Let, let me ask you something. Uh, we have got about a half a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what would you, how would you explain to my constituents, simply, I mean, we're we're talking about some fairly, you know, fairly high level abstractions here in terms of, you know, money supply, the role of the Fed. How would you explain this in in layman's terms to the to the average motorist who is paying for who is paid for to five dollars a gallon? About why is this happening? Put it in layman's terms. Well, I guess I would say there's two parts to that story. One is, you know, certainly the short-term story where I think the price has gone up more than would be justified by the fundamentals due to the fact that you have speculators that are pushing up the price. So you have speculators who are thinking prices will be higher in the future or at least for a short period of time. They are hoping to get so in. So speculators are driving up the price. That is one factor. That is one factor. Okay. The, the other factor? The other factor is simply the long-term story, that oil is a commodity in relatively limited supply. Um, demand is increasing very rapidly in, in the developing world, and it is almost certainly going to outstrip the rate of growth of supply. And the only way you can reconcile um, more demand and relatively limited increase in supply is with a much higher price. And so even without speculation, thank you, Mr. Chairman, even without speculation, you are you're based on the supply demands that you are talking about, you are saying that the price of oil, if, no, if nothing else changes, in terms of alternative sources, the price of oil is going to go up. Is that what you are saying? Exactly. I don't see any story where if we look out five years from now and let's say there is no speculators, you know, we are just looking at what the world economy looks like, plausible projections of growth, I don't see any story in which the price of oil is not considerably higher than it is today. Okay. I, I, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence on that. No problem. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Baker, you said earlier about subsidizing oil consumption. Tell me that. What was the statement you made earlier that we were, when we were doing that and what? 
that, that in effect, by having a large trade deficit, which is associated with an overvalued dollar, we are subsidizing our consumption of oil and all imports and paying for that with money that we have borrowed from foreigners. That, that corresponds so, to the trade deficit. Let, let me trade add, deficit which I think raises the question, so, so do you think rising fuel costs are a good thing? I think that they are an inevitable thing. That is part of the story. I didn't ask you. Do you think they are a good thing? Do you think they are a positive thing? I think there is positive. I mean, I am not trying to be evasive. There are positive aspects to it. I mean, it will In be. In light of what we just heard from uh, a small business there's owner. There are negative aspects as well, of course. None of us want to pay more for gas. Businesses are going to be very harmed. Some businesses will go out of business. On the other hand, exporters are going to do very well because the dollar will fall. So we are going mm -hmm. to see a lot of jobs created in export industries, also in import competing industries because okay. imports are now more expensive. There is going to be let more me, jobs let me, there. Let me get back to Dr. Murphy. You made a point uh, earlier. You said, I, I believe, added to the monetary base $1.6 trillion since September of 2008 to today. Uh, from 1913 to 2008, $932 billion. So in three short years or less than three years, um, more than we did in, I didn't do the math, but uh, what's that, almost 80 some years, or 90, 80 some years. Um, and uh, Mr. Mr. Baker, I think, called that timid uh, in his opening statement that the, the Federal Reserve's uh, approach to this was timid. Um, do, do, I, I assume you disagree with that. I, I, yeah, right. I disagree strongly, and it's I mean, it, partly it is a difference in our perspective as to what the pro appropriate policy response is that if I believe that the problem was that Alan, Chairman Alan Greenspan had interest rates too low after the dot-com crash and that helped fuel the housing bubble, mm -hmm. and so that was the wrong thing to do. That caused malinvestments. And, and so to me, what Chairman Bernanke has done is just doubled down on the, the wrong policies that uh, Chairman Greenspan put into place. Yeah. But, I, th I think Dr. Baker is coming from a different perspective, obviously, and so, right. Th so they would say it's timid because look, at it, it didn't work fully, so we yeah. need to put more medicine in. Whereas I'm saying, no, that's poison. Just pumping in, you know, extra money that you're creating out of thin air. Yeah. To, to use a colloquialism. Do, do me this. Uh, maybe you and, and Mr. Reinhardt in second. Rank order. I mean, look, because we, we we got supply and demand concerns. We got turmoil in the Middle East. We got those who say speculators, and then we got the the the, the Fed and quantitative easing and the devaluing of the dollar. So rank order. And, and let's let's just for the starter say all have some influence on on the price. Uh, of, of, of fuel and, and ultimately the price of gasoline. So, but, but rank order them in, in which one has the biggest, which is second, which is third, and, and which is fourth. And, and I would also, um, well, I will get to that article in a second, but do, do that first, then we will go to Mr. Reiner, Dr. Murphy. Uh, sure, sure. I mean, I think we should just be humble and say nobody knows for sure. We would have to turn back time and do the alternate universe to see what actually happens, right? So this is all speculative, no pun intended. Um, I think I personally think that the Fed has been has not fixed the problem. Okay, so it, it's true as, as Dr. Baker was saying. You could argue, well, no, the Fed averted a catastrophe, and so therefore, even though we're, we're in a sense both agreeing the Fed caused oil prices to go up, but he's saying that's you know arguably a good thing in, in one perspective. But I, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. I think. Year, you know, years from now, we're still going to look back and say, when is the economy going to get better? So in that sense, I, I think the Fed is, I personally would say it's the Fed. Now, in terms of speculators, again, that's sort of a loaded term, but I mean, it, if people are worried that the dollar is going to depreciate strongly, right. our, they our, would, our first question to yeah, you. Yeah, right. that's, that's what they're, partly they're supposed to do. Like yeah, it's normal behavior. function yeah. is a futures market is supposed to get it. allow that. Um, so you would, but you would say the Fed's actions are the number one reason that the price of gasoline for families and business owners went up, more so than turmoil in the Middle East, more so than rising demand from, from countries and rising demand period, you know, more so than supply and demand concerns? If you, from the uh, fall of 2008 till now, yes. I think if you are saying, a sh like the last six months, the Middle East, I think, is far a bigger influence of what is going on. But over the last but, three years? Right. If I had to pick one. Mr. Reinhardt, could you comment? The rank order in question. So one thing I do want to make clear is the distinction between the relative price of oil and the nominal price of oil, and similarly the rel real exchange mm -hmm. rate and the nominal exchange rate. We need real exchange rate depreciation to adjust the trade accounts. Maybe we should think about a way of getting that with a, without as much domestic inflation. We 
uh, global supply and demand is such that the real price of oil is going to be going up over time. But Fed policy will determine how, how much of that real price increase turns into money, nominal price increases. Mm -hmm. And I think over the longer history of the Fed, that is, over the last couple of decades, the, the very high nominal price of oil relates to the Federal Reserve's failure to achieve price stability. And so if you are looking for the big picture, why are oil prices so high? over the last two decades, it has got to be about Fed policy mm. because the Fed is responsible for the nominal prices everywhere. Right. Okay, now if you are asking in the last year or so or over the whole profile of quantitative easing, I would say that uh, it is mostly something about the balance of real supply and demand. Mm -hmm. The Fed comes, comes second. And I would put, a, a put third speculation. Uh, there has been a bit of discussion about the CFTC's right. uh, ongoing case. Uh, and it's not appropriate to opine on an, op you know, an open case, but I, I, I think you have to remember three important points. And the first is, in the futures markets, almost nothing settles into ca a cash transaction. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is, the futures market is very large relative to the cash market. So trying to manipulate cash to affect the futures market is the tail wagging the dog. Uh, but, but second, in a very short period, the tail can wag, wag the dog. Even in the, in the CFTC's uh, press release of yesterday, they say it was a strategy designed to first raise, then, then lower oil prices. So in the short run, speculation can matter. But the short run, it can be, uh, you know, f relatively short. Mm -hmm. But third, we do have to worry about speculation in the markets because it raises the volatility of prices, and that is just a deadweight loss for everybody. Right. It is just more expensive to, to use those markets efficient, efficiently for hedging. Okay. Thank you. Gentleman from Cleveland. Gentleman from Seattle. Careful. Careful. Um, I have heard the witnesses talk about the, um, the role of the Fed here, and it is uh, And that's what makes this hearing very instructive, because all of, you know, including Dr. Baker, all talk about the Fed has some role here. You know, there might be some debate about what kind of role, about where it falls in in the hierarchy of uh, of economic effects on the price of oil. You know, you talked about uh, supply and demand, then uh, then uh, the, the, then the Fed, and then speculation. You know, Mr. Mr. Reinhardt, am I right? And then what you did? Okay, so. Um, and we are talking about uh, the Fed's policy since, uh, since 2008, you know, the role that that has had on the price. But what, what hasn't been discussed here, and what I would like to ask you to, uh, uh, to consider and maybe just give me some quick response on, is the fact that in 19 13, when the Federal Reserve was created, it actually uh, created the transition away from the Article I, Section 8 responsibilities that were constitutionally vested in uh, Article I, the Congress, for the purpose of uh, coining money or controlling the money supply. That was taken away. You know, the Fed ends up with the responsibility. So my question to you is, uh, if if we see that the, the, the variable effect, <coughs> excuse me, and sometimes the adverse effect which the Fed has in the management of these things, <coughs> the question becomes, uh, what, about, what about having uh, the Fed being put back into control of the government as the, the founders intended? Uh, for example, being put under Treasury. Would you comment on that? Uh, you know, if we are really talking about, about the Fed as, as something that we really have very limited control over. Uh, what do you think of that? So I see the, the Federal Reserve Act is a delegation of congressional authority given to it in the Constitution to an independent agency, the Federal Reserve. Fundamental to that was the implicit belief that that independence would lead to better monetary policy over the long run because there are, are short-run and long-run considerations, uh, something decided in the Congress lends itself to a short-term gain and not enough assessment of the long-term benefit, 
the idea was giving the Fed independence so it can take account of the longer run benefits of price stability. I think the record is not good for the Federal Reserve in taking account of that longer run responsibility. Would, Dr. Mur Dr. Murphy, would you say the record is not good in the, over, the, over the long haul here, or what would you say? Well, right. I mean, the Fed was created to get rid of wild ups and downs, and then after they formed it, there was a Great Depression. So, I mean, it's, the Fed has not had a great track record over its history. Um, as far as your, your, question, your broader question, and I am speaking on my own, this isn't an IER position on monetary policy, obviously, but I, I don't think the issue is, well, should it be Ben Bernanke right now making Fed policy or Treasury Secretary Geithner? I don't, you know, I think if you are going to, if you No, I mean, there, there is some question about the structures here of whether or not there is public accountability and responsibility. If you can print, you can use uh